Hi, everyone. This is Tina Schmidt. Welcome back to Kingdom Walker 24-7. Today, we are picking up where we left off about our identity in Christ Jesus. So in the first episode, we covered some of those scriptures uh, regarding our identity. And so we're going to continue to uh, uh, discuss this most uh, wonderful revelation that we have in Christ and our identity and what he's done for us. We're going to go back to Romans 8, 29, 30. So we could look at this um, process. Okay. From whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So let's look at what is revealed in this passage. Number one, foreknowledge. Okay, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So number one, we see foreknowledge. And then we see in that passage also, he also predestined. This means he planned it for the book of our mission. He predestined us, meaning we had a plan to carry out before we even were born here. And then to be conformed to the image of his son. So now we see that God had foreknowledge, a plan before time, and then he predestined us with his book to, to give us the destiny that we were supposed to have in Christ. And then he it says conform. Now this means we discover our purpose and identity in Christ to conform. Okay. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So you see God's plan is being shown here. We were put here to be conformed to the image of his son. And then it says, moreover, uh, he might be the firstborn among many brethren, okay? Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. So we see after we are conformed uh, and we discover our purpose and identity in Christ, he calls us into obedience and understanding. So we, we move into now a purpose and understanding uh once we have discovered this purpose in Christ. And then he justifies. Because we are in Christ, he justifies us. When you're in Christ, you're justified. Because God is no longer looking at the flesh that can be shaken down. He's looking at what cannot be shaken down. And that is his son's spirit living in you, joined to you as one being. Jesus said before he died, I want them to know that I am in them and they are in me and we are one. You see, it's it's this discovery process of discovering who Christ is in us as we go through our transformation process. And then when we're justified, we're purified through Jesus and uh, we become worthy through Christ and then glorified. Because he says, he, uh, um, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. So he's calling us now because we have a predestined plan to be his. And then whom he called, he justified. How are we justified? By the blood of Jesus and the acceptance of him as our savior. So he lives in us. And those whom he justified, these he glorified. You see? We have to step up into what Christ has appropriated and offers us. We cannot continue down into this Adamic paradigm and wallowing in the trenches, keep begging and asking God for something. Okay. We're, we got to step up to what he's appropriated for us. We have to step up in faith to who we are, who he transformed us to be in him. Not asking Jesus to come down again 
and and to give us this and to give us that and to do this and to do that. We are to, it has already been appropriated, you see? So we have to step up into that grace. Remember I talked about that place of grace that's in his heart and in his spirit just for you. He's opened that. So your prayers have to be transformational. Lord, help me find that place of grace. Send your angels before me. Clear the way of the enemy. Send your mighty angels ahead of me, Lord. Help me find that place of grace. And get, and help me realize the authority you gave me over all disease and over all the powers of the enemy. You've appropriated it for me, Lord. Help me move into that grace that you have gave, given me. So I can do your kingdom work here. And I can be an example, an epistle of your victory. You see, we, we change our, our mindset into the kingdom instead of into the identity of a suffering soul separated by God here. I want to talk to you a little bit about now as we go into identity, discovering our identity in Christ. Do you ever wonder how Jesus discovered who he was? It's interesting, as a 12-year-old, when he was in the temple, they were looking for him, his parents. We see in Luke 2, uh, 46, 47, and uh, we even see 49 and 52. And they're talking, he's, the, the scripture talks about his parents. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And his parents uh, got on his case a little bit. And he said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And it also says in verse 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. He grew. He, he was already chasing after his father, seeking God, already filled with the Holy Spirit, already filled. And he was already trying to do his father's work, go about his father's business. He was spreading the kingdom. Hebrews 10, 5 says, But a body you have prepared for me, verse 7, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll, the book. I've come to do your will, O God. So we see this now. Um, uh, this quote here, Here I am, it is written about me in the scroll, the book. Okay, a scroll is a, uh, today we call them books. Back then they were big parchment scrolls. I have come to do your will, O God. And verse 10, uh, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. He knew who he was, but he discovered the writings of him in the word. So in the scriptures, you will find yourself. You can read those Psalms and you can find where you are. Your identity is something in that word of God. Isaiah 7.14 says, is simple, uh, Isaiah 7.14, they talk about the virgin birth. And Isaiah 7.15 says, his simple diet and living righteously. Verse 16, the kings will die before the boy, Jesus, knows enough to reject wrong from right. So they're talking about Jesus as a boy and how you know, his life moved along. Now, we know Isaiah had a lot to say about the coming Messiah. And we see uh, in Isaiah a lot about Jesus and his suffering on the cross. In reading those scriptures, he knew he was fulfilling those scriptures. So he discovered, ah, there I am. Oh, look, here in the Psalms, it's written of me. There I am. Now I'm going to fulfill these. He knew his identity was in there. And this is because Jesus lived a holy life. His life was defined by the word. You see, and so many people live outside of the scriptures and they only come to the scriptures to be rescued. They're not living their life in those protective boundaries of the scriptures. And see, this is the big difference. Christ walked a disciplined life in the word. He didn't go outside the word. He found who he was, his identity, 
in the scriptures. And so what happens with us, uh, when we step outside of that protective territory, we're stepping outside of the word of God, and we're trying to manage our life in the Adamic paradigm where all the good and evil is going on and the contention, and we're not living victoriously in the word. You see, the word will discipline your soul. Disciple. Disciple is the name of Jesus' followers, okay? They were his disciples, the apostles, right? Okay, that's where we get the word discipline. The word discipline comes from disciple. And disciples mean uh, following and learning in a discipline of Jesus. And so he disciplined uh, in his ministry. And they followed him. He says, follow, do my commandments. If you love me, you will you will uh, follow my commandments. You will obey my commandments. Because a lot of his commandments were on righteous living and obedience in love. And so this is how we form. We begin to form this relationship with Jesus. And he transforms us from our worldly paradigm, our worldly identity. He moves us into the word. The word becomes a discipline for us. And then we start to discover our identity in Christ because he is the living word. So again, I ask you when you're, you know, you have your challenges, where is your mind and what are those thoughts? Are they the enemy's seeds talking? Full of discouragement? Cussing? Are you full of woe and fear? Are the words in your head about what if? What if this? Well, what if that could happen? Well, what if that could happen? Well, if I do that, then what if that happens? That's all fear. Those are all hypothetical fantasies that the enemy puts in a person's head to preoccupy them away from the simplicity and the truth and the peace and the love of God. You see, we got to make that full identity shift into Christ. You know, Jesus talked about his body being the temple. And in John 2, 19, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. He was already referring to his body as the temple of God. He was already, Father God was already in him. Jesus knew that his clay body was, the, was a temple for God. God wasn't out in the concrete temple. In, he was more inside here, in the clay temple. He was already identified in his father, and he knew that his body was the temple where God dwelt. He saw himself as the lamb, okay, and as the temple, but he understood it also as his own body, a place for God. Um now the place, uh, the temple is a place on earth for God's will to flow out of the heavens into the temple. So if you remember, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, the power of God would move, uh, inside that temple in the Holy of Holies. And, and the priest, they would go that time of the year up and they would go from the, the place where they slaughtered and had the blood of the lambs on the altar. Then they, they washed. Then they went into the, the, the chamber inside the tabernacle where there was the, the bread and uh, the drink and the lampstands. And this is the fellowshipping, the fellowshipping of God. And that bread and that drink was put there, not because God needed to eat and drink, but it was a continual reminder that God is alive and dwelling and fellowshipping. It would kept God's presence in front of the people. Okay, and right there with the priests. And over time, it just became a ritual. Oh, we got to put the bread in there. Okay, yeah, I got that. Okay, now we got to put the wine. Okay, now we got to switch that out and make sure that it became a function and it began to lose the holiness, the reverence, the, the, the tenderness for God. Okay. Now, moving from that midsection, then they had a curtain. 
and the Holy of Holy was there. That's where the ark was. And the angels with their outstretched wings over the mercy seat. The mercy seat, not the not the um, judgment seat. It was the mercy seat. And this is where, you know, the, the high priest would come in and sprinkle that blood right on that altar. Right on, excuse me, right on that, that altar where the ark was. And that would have been acceptable for the sins. And it was a placeholder for the Messiah to come. So the the high priest then would intercede and um, intermediate for the sins of the people. And he had to be pure. If he wasn't pure, he would be killed. And uh, they uh, used to tie a rope to his ankle. <laughs> and as he walked, if he had sinned, if he had done things wrong, if he wasn't cleansed properly and hadn't done everything right and kept himself from sin before going into that holy of holies, he would have been marked, um, I mean, he would have been unpure. And that holy, holy presence would have incinerated him or killed him. So they would tie a rope in there. And if the if the guy died, they'd have to drag him out. But what happens with Jesus is he's paid that price for us. Some people never come out of the first part of the sacrifice they plead the blood uh, um, and they want forgiveness for their sins they haven't gone into that chamber yet where they're fellowshipping daily with god see that fellowship and that relationship of keeping god present in your life every day and talking to him and sharing and breaking bread with him and i'm not talking just about communion and we've talked about this before in my video uh, people have turned communion into a ritual. They're not understanding. It's breaking bread and sharing and practicing the presence of the living God. And in that relationship, God will show you things and teach you things. And he will bring you into that holy place. And Jesus is the lamb. And when we walk with him, in that blood of the lamb, we plead that blood and that covers us. He gives us entry through him to the Father. But he lets you know. He lets you know when that is time. You see, it's a relationship. We are walking with him. But our identity now is no longer way out there in the world. It's now in this, this place where the lampstands are and the bread and the drink. And we are communicating in relationship, uh, communicating in relationship with the Lord. This is what he wants. He wants this loving relationship. And in that, we form our identity. We begin to understand because he's teaching us by the power of his spirit and his wisdom and his love, how gentle and kind he is, what his true will for you is. Jesus, walk this earth healing the sick, uh, making blind eyes see, opening the ears of the deaf, healing the lepers, raising the dead. He did all of this. And then he also spoke about the kingdom of heaven and who we were. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, he wanted us to see a glimpse of that kingdom of heaven. And as he spoke these words, it transformed people. So, we have to have a dialogue with the Lord. And that has to be what is dominant in our thinking. Because now we live within we live within the word. We're not outside of the word. Using the word as an incantation or a slot machine to get an answer for something while we're wallowing around in this world. You see, that's using God. And that's abusing God. God gave us his word as a gift. And he gave it to us to encourage us to walk with him and become the fullness of Christ in us. So that when what can be shaken off will go off of us and we what will be left is the purity of what is valuable to God. The rapture. The rapture is on its way. And even Jesus said to uh, John, Apostle John, 
He said, I'm coming soon and my judgment is with me. Okay. Now that doesn't mean you sit around and go, well, he's not here yet. I think I have a few more days to sin. That is really abusive to the Lord. I'm telling you, it shouldn't be there in your heart. What should be there is, thank you, Lord. I have another day of opportunity to learn of you and your glory, to overcome my challenges and have your victory so that when the time comes and you rapture me and bring me up to you, I will be bearing so much fruit. I will have baskets and loads of fruit with me. And you will say, good, uh, my servant, well done. See, that's where our heart should be. Let's look at 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 21. Now, he's talking about Jesus. This is uh, Paul brought with a letter to the Corinthians. For he has made him, now he is God. For he has made him, talking about Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That we would be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, you see, if we don't live a righteous life, we can't fulfill that. And so what he's saying here, he has made, for he, God has made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus was pure that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus swapped out his holy righteousness for our sins. You know what he did? God did for you. I don't think people really get this. They're looking for some kind of solution that is outside of what he's already done. He gave us his righteousness for our sins. That means all the sins that you've ever done. He said, give me those sins. Now here, take my righteousness. Then when God looks at you, he will only see the son's righteousness. However, if you choose not to live righteously, he can't give it to you. Righteousness is a way of life. Righteousness means you seek the Lord. You look for the Lord. You, you work with, within the, the, the framework of his word so he can rebuild you and give you his kingdom mindedness. And then you start behaving righteously and you get a spirit of discernment to know right from wrong. And you begin to discern and then you begin to magnify him and work with the fruits of the spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit will come. Whoever has, he will give more to if you're working with it. You don't just get one gift from the Holy Spirit. You can get multiple basketfuls of gifts of the Holy Spirit if you're working with what he gave you. Okay, if you, if he, if you ask the Lord to give you a gift of the Holy Spirit and you're not working it, you will get less because you're not appreciating what he gave you. Okay, so if, if, if he gives somebody something and they don't make it grow, he sees a lack of responsibility in even that small amount or a lack of appreciation. So why should he give more? Okay, it's it's like that. So when he gives you something in the Holy Spirit, you grow with it and you're grateful with it. And you don't say, well, that's not good enough, God. I'm waiting for a big old monster miracle. I'm waiting to sh for you to show me how much you love me and that you haven't forgotten me. So give me this big giant miracle. That's not right. You see, that's 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 not right for our wonderful, loving God who wants to give you everything. We have to move in righteousness because we love him and we want to be near him and we want him to make us like him and to help us make decisions so that we can learn what righteousness is. He wants us to let go of our earthly identification and follow him into the kingdom. And if we are made the righteousness of God through Christ, we are uh, we are made that way from the divine perspective of God. Not on earth, not an earthly perspective. Remember, I said when Jesus walked the earth, he always tried to see people as they are in the kingdom. He's, he he 
He didn't look at what was right in front of him. He said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are when the people come against you to try to persecute you. Blessed. You are the salt of the earth. He saw people with kingdom eyes. And that's why in um, the other video I did on um, are you ready for the kingdom, we see that Paul went through his transition. And he no longer saw people as um, uh, regular people. He saw them. He says, we no longer judge people from a worldly standpoint, a worldly point of view. Because he had made his transformation into the kingdom of heaven. You see, and that's what God is trying to do with us in our walk with him. He's trying to transform our identity. And when our identity is transformed, our perception of the world will change. So your earthly identity is, let's say, okay, so when I say earthly identity, we're going to look at your paradigm. The world around you 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 gain information by your experience as a baby, okay? And so let's say the baby touches a hot fire and he gets burned and he says, okay, I know what that is now. That's fire and I, I can burn. Uh, a baby, a kid, you know, he's playing and he falls down and he discovers pain and he discovers he got a sore knee. And so he says, oh, if I do this, then this can happen. So he begins to formulate the reality of his world based on a physical context. And that becomes this paradigm that he lives in. Okay. But Jesus is spirit. Like he told Nicodemus, that which is spirit is spirit. That which is of the flesh is of the flesh. So when you're growing up in this world and you're moving around and operating, you are operating in perception of the physical. And so you are imprinted by your environmental conditions, society, your work identity, your social identity. You're a mom. You're a dad. You're a, a, a banker. You're a police officer. You have worldly identity continuously. But when you move in the spirit, you are no longer identified in this worldly realm. When you move into the spirit of Christ, you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And many people waste a great deal of their life because they haven't made that transition. And Paul said when he, you know, he came full all the way through, full circle and all the way out of this worldly paradigm. And he said, we are ambassadors of Christ. We are seated in the high places with Christ. So he made his identity shift. And his whole gospel was about this. And we people miss it. Jesus' gospel was about it too, about the kingdom of heaven. And we stopped short. Okay, because we've let our religious institutions uh, stop there. And we become, we, we start working and operating in the secular realm and not moving into the fullness that Christ has given us. And so... You know, this is this is why the, the great revival has happened and is happening again, because the pulse, the push of that Holy Spirit is pushing into the spirit realm. Hardships come in this warfare. OK, evil spirits and the enemy wants to stop the movement of this Holy Spirit. So when you are forced between that rock and a hard place, you have a choice. You are identified with your troubles and the trenches of this world, or you are launched into Christ all the way as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, because Christ does not want anything less than all of you. All of you. He doesn't just want you on Sunday. He doesn't just want you to believe in him uh, only when things get rough. He doesn't want you part-time. You have to choose him or choose the world. And the great testing has come upon the world. And those who have chosen the world have been tested and weeded out. Judgment has already fallen on many of them. There's a judgment is already in place for many people. They haven't repented. They're not trying to make things right. And this is what is called the unpardonable sin. And we're going to talk about this an, another time. And people who have walked away from the Lord to pursue 
uh, the things of the world and have done so very evilly, their judgment has already been rendered. We'll talk about this later in, in another thing, uh, uh, another episode. So now Christ's identity gives us truth, family, uh, the eternal perspective, the kingdom family, the kingdom principles, and we are grafted into the holy eternal family of God and Christ and his angels and the kingdom forever. Okay, so you have a choice. You have your worldly identity or you have kingdom identity in Christ. And you become the fullness that God has predestined you to be. I believe uh, John 1 is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. To all who would receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Verse 13, children not born of natural descent, but born of God. Not born by a man's will. Okay, so he's not ta he's talking not about ancestry here. Okay, for reproduction and a man's will. He says, children not born of natural descent. He clearly says they're not born of, of blood with natural ancestry, but born of God. That means you are a son or daughter of God. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So he takes these souls, us, you and I, okay, we're planted here, and I talked about this process before, and we discover who God is, we are tested here, the weeds are weeded out, we come into the fullness of Christ, and as Christ grows in us, we become sons and daughters of God. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. This is this is fascinating because this is the last hours of Jesus' life on the earth, and he spills it out. Now he's just telling him, telling him what it's all about. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. He gave him this, this mission. Remember, we talked about that earlier that God had predestined us, and he foreknew and he predestined us, and then he conformed us. So Jesus is enforcing that. And he says, you did not choose me, I chose you so that you might bear fruit. Okay, Romans 6, 6 we know that our old self was crucified with him, Jesus crucified, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Paul came across an amazing revelation. Paul realized the power of sin in the flesh, and he had to ha he knew he had to thresh that out. Remember, Paul had some very difficult hardships. You know, he was uh, shipwrecked several times, was beaten with rods, he was uh, flogged with lashes, he was subjected to bandits, he'd been naked and cold, uh, he goes into a lot about this, and this built fortitude in a person, and fortitude is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And Paul, remember, he was ruthless in his prior life as a as a persecutor of the Christians. And when Jesus, he met Jesus with that uh, in that glory light, his life changed. But he had to go through that morphing process, that process of putting away the old and moving into the new. So we talked about it, but this, this transformation he had to go through is what gave us the richness of these scriptures. He wrote these scriptures based on the inspiration that was coming from the Holy Spirit through his struggles. And he says, we know that our old self was crucified with him. So when Jesus got crucified, remember he died for our sins. The sins of us get transferred onto him. Now, in the ancient days, okay, they used to take the lamb, the animals, and the priests would lay their hands on that innocent animal 
and transfer the sins of the people onto the animal, this innocent animal, okay, a lamb. I don't know if you've ever seen baby goats or baby lambs, but they are the cutest, most innocent, most beautiful little creatures. And um, they are remarkable little animals. And to, to lay the sins of people onto that innocent animal and then to kill that animal and have its blood pay for the sins of people, um, I think people don't realize that's what Jesus did for us. He was innocent and wonderful and kind and and righteous and so when he went on to that cross by faith you transfer all of your sins onto that land that's how much he loves you that's how much god loves you to take away the corruption of your life and put it onto the lord now, people will say, oh, well, that's really cruel, hard God. No, I'll explain. Okay, we have to go back to Genesis. Sin entered the world when Adam and Eve turned away from God. And in Genesis 3.15, God said to the serpent who fooled them and beguiled them and deceived them, now there will be enmity between your seed and the woman's seed, and her seed shall crush your head. Okay, Adam and Eve had Abel and Cain. Cain murdered his brother. And Jesus said about the enemy, he said he was a murderer from the beginning. So you can see that the enemy seed had been put in Cain, and Cain killed Abel. Innocent blood. So there was a prophecy coming that Adam and Eve knew about, about a redemption. If you remember Adam and Eve, uh, it was the Lord who had given them the skins of animals to wear because they were no longer protected in the garden. Can you imagine what that must have looked like to them when an animal was slayed for their benefit? So something had happened in the garden that caused blood to be shed, okay? And when they were cast out of the garden, Okay, they were cast out of the garden. Blood had to be shed. And since then, there has been a requirement of blood to be shed until it could be right, made right by the Messiah. And that was Jesus. So, you understand how powerful it is when he pays for your sins on the cross. The sins that you have in your body and disease get transferred to him. Paul says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That is that body, flesh body, gets done away with. It's been put on the cross. Now it's up to us, it's up to you, it's up to me to walk into what he has appropriated for us. We put away the sins, the wrong desires of the flesh, the wrong thoughts, we put that away because it's already been paid for and done with. And too many people still wallow in the in the body. They wallow in the sickness. They wallow in the disease. They wallow in their stress. They justify it. If You know, I've talked to people before. I said, you know, God can help you with that. Yeah, I know. I know God can do that. But you don't understand. And they roll right over the words. And they elaborate and out of the mouth spews the complaints and the paradigm, the reinforcement of that paradigm over and over. And so they're not walking in the spirit. They're walking in the flesh. And their their paradigm is still in the fleshly world. They haven't come out of it. And so we have to be compassionate about helping. But, you know, it comes by revelation, small revelation by revelation. Until the seed of the Spirit of God can grow and grow and choke off those weeds. Okay. So we are no longer slave to sin when you when you get rid of those things of the body. And um let's go to uh Jeremiah 1 5. This is our identity in Christ. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, 
I set you apart and I appointed you. Again, we go back to what was said before about um, this, what he foreknew, you know, God foreknew and he brought it out and we conform to it. And then we are, we're transformed and we're justified and we're glorified. And so it says here in Jeremiah, the same thing. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you before you were born. So God had a plan for you to fulfill in that spirit of Christ. So let's use a, a metaphor. Let's say Jesus opened up his spirit like a tent. It just opened up. And you see these holes in his spirit. What are those holes? Those are places for each and every one of you. He's waiting for you to walk into. He's waiting for you to walk into his spirit and to become one with him. And when he closes that robe and pulls back everything that belongs to him, when this whole worldly paradigm is rolled up, okay, and this earth is shaken and the whole physical universe is shaken, and this, whole, this whole thing gets shaken down, what will come up out of that is what God considers valuable to retrieve. And that's going to be you in the transformed likeness of his son. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's treasured possessions, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's treasured possession. People don't think about that much. How much do you think God loves you? The creator of all life in every heaven and in every realm. You are his treasured possession. You were born here with a mission to grow in his spirit. Remember, I talked to you about what, it, how, how your life of victory is a testimony to the powers in the heavenly realms. Even the angels watch in awe as God transforms you. It's something they've never seen before. Okay, so when God created us as humble creatures, he moved his power into us after the fall through Jesus. Okay. So the prophets were waiting for the Messiah. Now his spirit is fully released to the people through the Lord and the transformation is this is the kingdom of heaven doing its amazing things on earth. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. This is Paul now. He's made his full transformation. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, if Paul had lived with one leg in the old paradigm, he would still be full of guilt because of his sins and all the, the desires of the members of his flesh, as he says. Okay, and all the guilt he had for... Um, what he had done to the Christians, he made his transformation. He had to. He had to jump into Christ and into the kingdom. He couldn't go just halfway. Okay. And he says, now I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. So he's walking around in his flesh body, but he is no longer um, the same person. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. The old self is dead along with the sin that Christ took. And I no longer live. He's not alive anymore, Paul says. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So the old self had died. And many of you are going through your transition, this, this identity shift where the worldly part of you, okay, has died off. It's crumbling off. It's dying off. And each and every day, you move closer into the spirit of Christ, and he begins to teach you things. 
and things that used to grab your attention before, that you used to preoccupy yourself with before, no longer interest you. Not at all. Because the self that used to be identified and wanting those things is gone. So you continue forward, keeping your eyes on the Lord. Seek the Lord continually, as it says. He will transform you. Okay. John 15, 15. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So do you see he gave us everything? Everything that I learned from my father. Do you realize Jesus had to learn? It wasn't just given to him. He had to walk it out. He had to have fortitude and strength and courage and faith. He had to live in the word, not outside of it, so that the boundary lines fell in pleasant places for him. And then he says, I've called you friends. Some people say, well, Jesus is very far away. I don't feel him. And the, the thing is, there's something in your paradigm, it's something in your belief system that the devil has put there, or a stronghold in your belief system that has separated you from the simplicity of this love offering to you, this simple truth, how much he loves you. All of Jesus' ministry was about love for his Father and love for you. And he demonstrated the true heart of the Father by all the things he did to help others, to feed others, to heal others, to have compassion. Uh, even on the the, the uh, Romans and the you know the Gentiles, he talked about loving your enemy. Now we're going to get into another subject here, but uh, so I'll, I'll just curb it a little bit. He talked about loving your enemies. He doesn't mean love those who are opposed. Uh, strongly opposed against the righteousness and justice of God's throne. And I'll tell you examples of that. Um, when he gave out his woes to the Pharisees, he was condemning them. Okay. So when he says, love your enemies, he's not talking about necessarily those that oppose you. But if you remember in the environment that he was in, the Romans uh, were enemies to the Jews. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. The Romans didn't, you know, every, there was a lot of different racial tensions there. And they considered the Romans their enemy. And Jesus said, love your enemies, be good to them. And then he gave examples of the good Samaritan who came and, and helped someone um, who wasn't a Jew. It was an enemy of the Jews, the Samaritans. And he talked about this Samaritan who helped a person. And then he also demonstrated loving the enemy by healing a Roman soldier servant who was more like a son. You see, he was talking about loving your enemies. And so as an example of Christ's love, we love our enemies. But contrast that with his amazing rhetoric when he came against the Pharisees who were outright doing wrong. Okay. And he came against those in the marketplace and made whips out of straps and began to tear that marketplace apart and overturn tables and the money tables and, and made a shambles. He overturned it all. So we have to be clear about what he, he meant. And, you know, he doesn't like things coming against the, the righteousness and justice of his father's throne. So he says, I've called you friends and everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. So he's given us everything we need. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is that foreknowledge, okay? And the assignment that's been given to us. When we come here, we have an assignment. We have that scroll or what we call the book. Okay, that's pre-written for us that we're supposed to fulfill because Christ's spirit is here waiting in those big empty places of grace in his spirit for you to fulfill, to walk into and fulfill. 
Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see the transformation here? Paul and the believers are up here in heaven. They're already in there. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, 8, and 9, for the spirit, excuse me, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We're back to discipline again. And of, uh, uh, oh, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord. By the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. You see, we don't earn it. It's a love gift when we walk and we receive the Lord. We walk with him. We receive him as our Savior. Second okay. Timothy 1.13, what you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus and guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So, um, I think we're almost about to wrap it up. I just want to say, um, I'll give you one more, and that is uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 17. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. In verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And verse 17, therefore, if any was in Christ, he is a new creation. So would you like to join me in a prayer right now? And we will pray for you to have revelation and to start moving into your transformation of going from a worldly-minded to a kingdom-minded citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray, okay? Father God and beloved Jesus, you are holy and your name is holy. We acknowledge you and we thank you and praise you that you have given us your word, that we may dwell in your word and learn of you. We thank you that we are fulfilling the words of your son when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father God and Jesus, that we are able to be epistles for you and walk this earth and bring the kingdom of heaven as a testimony and a witness to those in on earth and in the heavenly realms. We thank you that we become epistles and examples of Christ's love. We thank you. We ask now, Lord, hear our petition. By your grace, by your kindness, and your mercy, we acknowledge your love, and we give you our love right now, Lord. Now let's open our hearts up and worship the Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can worship you, that you transform us into your likeness. We love you, Lord. We love you. Continue to let your love flow to God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit. God, we come before you now. We bring our, our prayers before you. And right now, let's pray for those. Lord, for all those listening and all those watching, I pray right now that you bless them and pour the fire of your Holy Spirit down in them and open up their hearts where you are knocking and open up their hearts and the eyes and ears of their heart to receive, to receive you, to receive your truth. I ask now for the power of the Holy Spirit to help them in their transformation process go from their worldly, earthly, limited paradigm into the unlimited and powerful 
wonderful, heavenly realm of your kingdom into your spirit, Christ, into you. We ask now that the angels go before us and clear the way so that our path directly into your grace is clear. Thank you. Walk every attempt of the enemy in our body, in our mind, and spirit, and soul, from hampering us from achieving this, to walk fully in your spirit by your grace. Thank you, God. Now I ask also, Father God and Jesus, that every single one of our guardian angels now extend their hands over us in prayer, so that what we pray, by the power of your spirit and the might of your name, comes true according to your will for us I ask that you help every person here help them in their walk and their transformation into the kingdom help them with kingdom mindedness open the word to them Lord and help them walk in discipline to desire you I ask that you shift the desires in their heart so that they become more loving more attentive to you to minister to you and to create a flow of joy in their hearts for you and your joy over them. Bless them with your healing power, your spirit of joy. And now, Lord, we're going to move into healing. And I ask right now that you dispense your mighty power through their body right now. Wherever there is darkness, we command that darkness to depart. Wherever there is disease, we command that disease out in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the authority you give us, God. Thank you for the authority, Jesus, in the mighty power of your name to drive out every sickness and disease. We thank you and we stand on your word. That we have all power over the enemy, as it says in your word. We thank you. We drive out all darkness and sickness and disease right now. In Jesus' mighty name. And speak in the spirit. And everybody who believes in speaking in the spirit, speak in the spirit right now. And drive out those diseases by the authority of Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now move your great, and mighty, wonderful power and your Holy Spirit into those dark places, Lord, and fill it with you in our soul, in our mind, in every part of the body. And where there is darkness and disease, we cast it out. We condemn it and tell it to get out in Jesus' name. For every evil spirit, we command deliverance right now and command every evil spirit to depart and every false belief and every fear and every false thought and word that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We condemn it right now in Jesus' name and we destroy all those evil things that have tried to plague us. Right now we cast it out in Jesus' name. And take our sins, Lord. We nail it to the cross right now in your name. All the sins are nailed to the cross in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, cover us in your blood, in your mighty blood. We plead the blood over us now, the blood that died to save us. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And thank you, Lord, for taking our sins away. We thank you. Now we are free for your your wonderful kingdom, to walk with you, to be friends with you, that sin is removed from our lives and we can look for you and seek you wholly and righteously. As you transform us, we thank you for the transformative power that you are working within us right now in welcoming us, become the fullness of you as the Father has gifted us to be and written for us from before the beginning of time predestined us to be yours, predestined us to fulfill our mission here on earth, conforming us into your likeness, justifying us, 
through your blood and moving us into your glory. Christ in us is the hope of God's glory. We thank you that we can fulfill this. Lord, we thank you that you continue to transform us so that our mind, our body, our soul, and our spirit is now living in the kingdom of heaven with you as you shift our identity from this world into your kingdom, Lord, where you await us. We thank you that you live in us and open the way for us to have you, your Father, the kingdom, your Holy Spirit. Thank you. Now I pray for all those watching and within the sound of my voice, Lord, would you cover them and protect them and seal them. Put your seal upon them now. For we have repented of our sins, Lord. We have repented of our sins, covered in your blood. Now seal us in you. Thank you. Thank you that you welcome us into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you that you teach us through revelation and to become more righteous, Lord, to become righteous so that we reflect you and learn from your word and live in your word. Thank you so much. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to learn of you. We know that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory and the majesty and the wealth and the wisdom, and all the prosperity, and all the glory belongs to you. And we acknowledge you, Lord. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. We give you our love and adoration. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, thank you. Amen. So thank you for joining me. I hope this was helpful for you and inspiring for you as you learn to make your trans transition from your worldly identity into the identity that Christ has appropriated for you uh, in eternity. If you want to contact me, just scroll down to the bottom of the uh, description in the video and you can contact me there. I am interested in interviews. I've had emails from many of you who have had healings and and supernatural encounters with the Lord, and I would love to interview and uh, maybe share your testimony uh, in my ministry. So if that interests you, you can scroll down and find my, my contact down uh, below the video in the description. Please like um, and subscribe and support and follow, and I'll try to continue to have more um informative videos uh, for you to share and learn with. Remember, we're, we want to learn and in, be inspired and glorify Jesus and his kingdom and the Father God and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thank you for joining me. Bye-bye.